All right, can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Um, this, is, this is a big room, <laughs> so thanks, thanks for coming. Um, and thanks to people uh, who are watching online. Um, so my name is Adam Blackwell, and uh, I work at Newsbank, um, but only since last Wednesday. Um, and I mention that because uh, Newsbank is a company that uh, consolidates and distributes historical and current news. And I say that's a little bit awkward for me today because my presentation is on how useful historical and current news can be in research and teaching. But in my defense, I will just say that I submitted this proposal many months before I had any idea I'd be working at Newsbank. And, and hopefully you'll find my argument a little bit more nuanced than, hey, news is really good. Um, so. 20 years ago, I, uh, I was still working in academia. Uh, I'd been teaching for several years at the University of Utah, which is State University in Utah. And um, the class I taught the most was just kind of the basic intro to scholarly research and writing. And uh, I mentioned this in my presentation at last year's UKSG, uh, that every semester I had kind of a guaranteed way of blowing my students' minds. Uh, and that was by telling them that the New York Times was not a scholarly source. Now, what I didn't say last year was that shocking my students about the New York Times, it wasn't just something I did for fun, it was part of a very conscious strategy to instill skepticism of the mainstream media. And so really like most of my colleagues, probably all of my colleagues, I regularly trotted out examples like this one. You know, I told students if they uh, saw an article about copyright on an ABC news site, then they should remember that ABC was owned by Disney and Disney is very interested. He has a big financial stake in how copyright law is decided. And if they saw an article about an oil shortage on an NBC news site, then I made sure they knew that NBC was owned by General Electric. Now, in recent years, uh, as I've talked with friends who's, who are still at the University of Utah and at other universities, uh, it's become clear to me that perceptions have changed quite a lot. And now it seems most students are not particularly surprised to hear that the New York Times isn't a scholarly source. And there's even a few of them, um, and this would be particularly true, I think, in more politically conservative states like Utah. There's a few students who actually think that the New York Times is really just fake news. Now, this loss of trust in the New York Times, which is really, you know, kind of stands in for a, a loss of trust in the mainstream media as an institution as a whole, it's, it's probably something that the 2001 version of myself would have, uh, would have celebrated. But today it makes me really nervous. Um, and I was already nervous about this in 2019, about this trend. But then in 2020, we really saw, I think, the harm that this breakdown of faith in the media as an institution uh, had. So you had people who were ignoring the mainstream reporting on COVID-19 and we're going to these really sort of fringy sites to get information about treatments and cures. And, you know, we saw something pretty similar after the 2020 US presidential election, when people went to these same kinds of sites, social media, fringe sites, and um, they read all these false allegations about election fraud. Um, and here, you know, I want to make something clear that when I'm referring to the media and the mainstream media, I'm not just talking about the New York Times, the Guardian, um, and other titles that uh, most people or many people regard as kind of left-leaning. Um, I'm also talking about Rupert Murdoch's uh, Fox News. And there are, you know, Fox News is something that many educators for many years, and you know, I'll raise my hand here, we just wished our students wouldn't watch or would watch less of. Um, but, I, but now we see when people move from Fox News that the results are not necessarily so good and that I think if you had President Trump's former, uh, pr former President Trump supporters, if they had stuck with Fox News in 2020, then the so-called big lie 
that the election was stolen would have never taken hold. So in one, in one way, I think you could argue that the loss of trust in Fox News was just as big a problem as the loss of trust in the New York Times and other, and other titles like that. Anyway, today, in my presentation, I want to ask this question. How do educators persuade students that the mainstream media, while imperfect, is nonetheless not fake news? In short, how can we restore trust in the media? And I'm not talking about the naive, almost childish trust that my students used to have in the New York Times, but an informed trust, and one that recognizes that the media, mainstream media, is generally a pretty good source of information. Um, before we get into the subst substance, um, I want to just acknowledge uh, one thing, and that this presentation will be focused on examples from the US. This is where I've lived for many years. Uh, it's what I know best. Um, however, I do firmly believe that the problems we'll be looking at today and potentially some of the solutions are truly universal. Now, I've used the word persuade a couple of times already, um, and I imagine that might have uh, thrown up some red flags for you. Um, we, we had a chance to do a poll, and I, and I, I was too late to do it, but um, in the end, it probably wouldn't have mattered because the poll question I was going to ask you was... Um, how many of you have recently persuaded somebody of something? And you know, my guess is that that purple segment would be you know, the number of people who had done that. And so why is it though? Why is it that it's so difficult to persuade people about anything? Now, shamelessly, uh, I am using this quote by Bacon for the third time at UKSG. And I keep coming back to it because I think Bacon really says it all. I just don't know how you top this formulation. We believe the things that we want to believe. Now, I think it may be easier to grasp this point using an analogy of, of food, of junk food specifically. If people ate junk food because they were fooled by fake ingredients lists, then it would be easy enough to get them to stop eating junk food. You would just have to show them the real ingredients lists. But I think we all have a sense this wouldn't help, this wouldn't stop people from eating unhealthy food. And so recognizing this, there's an element now in nutritional science and dieting science that is increasingly focused on mindfulness. So it's not so much don't eat that third piece of pizza because it's not healthy, it's don't eat that third piece of pizza because the feeling you have now after eating two pieces is more pleasant than the feeling you will have if you eat a third piece. So why might this approach be more effective? I think the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt gives us a possible answer here. Uh, through an analogy of a rider and an elephant, height contrasts the rational analytic self, so the self that would in theory be capable of looking at an ingredients list and saying, oh, not healthy, not for me. He contrasts that rational self with the emotional self, the one for whom good health in 20 years is much less important than how the self feels right now, than feeling good right now. And in Height's analogy, the rider is the rational self and the elephant is the emotional self. So sustained healthy eating will require an appeal to the elephant because while the rider can occasionally coax the elephant to do what the rider thinks is best, in the end, the elephant is gonna do whatever it feels like. And at heart, I'd say we're all elephants. So returning to the question, how do we restore trust in the mainstream media? I think the food analogy gives us a clue and we can hope to restore trust by helping students get to a point where they just feel better trusting the media than not trusting it. So to have chance of, any chance of succeeding, I think it's really important to know what people who have rejected the mainstream media, what they're currently reading, hearing, and watching. You know, and that's easier said than done if 
Like, you know, you live in a bubble, and, and I think like a lot of people, I do live in a bubble. Most of my friends think the things I think, believe the things I believe, and this is true whether we're talking geographically or in an online community. Um, but I did find a way to get out of my bubble, um, and, and telling you that, I have to actually sort of make a bit of a confession here. And I'm going to introduce you to uh, Trent Hamness. Now, the first thing I'll tell you about Trent Hamness is he doesn't exist. This was the name that my then 15-year-old son inexplicably gave to a Facebook account he created just to get some kind of video game credit. And once he got the credit, he abandoned the account. Until one day, he, he, thought, he decided he wanted to look at the Facebook page of a conspiracy-loving member of our extended family and who had unfortunately blocked me a couple of years earlier. And much to my wife's irritation, it was her aunt, after all, uh, my son went through this aunt's page and he trollishly liked a bunch of her really extreme posts and he just wrote, yep, on a bunch of others. Now, these days, Trent's posts are fairly innocuous. Um, but in the early months, especially during the first lockdown, uh, they were more trollish, more confrontational. And so what started out as a family joke between me and my son morphed into a genuine troll account. Now, this trolling won Trent uh, a lot of friends on Facebook who didn't know in real life, but who rejected out of hand the mainstream media. And so this became really helpful for me because it gave me access to what people who rejected the media, what they were reading and what they were posting and liking and sharing. It was a real uh, useful research account for me. Anyway, so I'm going to show you some of uh, the things that Trent's friends were sharing, including uh, this one friend um, who was actually his first non-family friend, uh, Tiffany America. I don't think that's a real name. Um, but anyway, this is one of uh, Tiffany's posts, and it, it, it dates to the beginning of the war in Ukraine. And as you can see, it includes a generic statement um, of sympathy, a story about Zelensky, and two photos. And there it is, though, the suggestion that there's a lot more to this war than we are being told. Uh, this is a post from a different friend, um, and there again you see it, this suggestion that you really don't know what you think you know. This post is a mishmash, but the idea is really the same. Uh, the writer tells everyone really not to trust what they're seeing reported about Ukraine in the media, in the mainstream media, but, and then it's in this now iconic phrase to, you know, they should do their own research. And these, these skeptical posts about Ukraine continued even after we'd seen hundreds of photos and dozens of videos of the devastation there. You can see in this one, I think the inverted commas around the word war uh, again suggests that things are just not what they seem. Same with this tweet, same idea. There's a suggestion that there can't really be this war going on, can there? Not if you two can just go there and play a concert in Kyiv. And it's not, just, it's not just Ukraine, really any topic can be co-opted into this narrative that the media, the mainstream media is deceiving us and a charge of naivety if you don't realize that. Same thing here with a, uh, a post about vaccines, COVID-19 vaccine. And now we come full circle with this post, there's a suggestion that just as doctors who were keen to speak up about the dangers of the COVID-19 vaccine, just as they were silenced in the mainstream media, uh, now reporters who want to tell the truth about the, you know, the so-called war in Ukraine, they are also being silenced in the media. And this is where it leads. Someone stating outright that they no longer see the people who work for the mainstream media as reporters and journalists, but instead as actors, liars, and thieves. Now you probably heard the expression, we are what we eat. I think today it would be more accurate to say 
we are what we read and what we watch. And when I scroll down Trent Hamness's Facebook news feed, I can see why people's confidence in the mainstream media is shaken. But people's news feeds don't get like that purely by accident. The algorithms require at least some assertive choice. You know, you have to like certain posts, you have to uh, accept certain friend requests. So Trent Hamlis's friends and others who believe the mainstream media is, uh, is fake news, um, they must be getting something out of believing that. But what? What is it that they get out of believing, sharing, and liking all of these don't trust the mainstream media posts? And I've thought about this and I've come up with three things. One, they get a feeling of belonging to a supportive community. And I see this all the time scrolling through Trent's news feed. On his uh, fictional birthday, he got a lot of friends wishing him happy returns. Um, others went through some of his old posts and gave him supportive uh, comments and likes. And you know, one friend uh, admitted to um, uh, depression and, and she received a lot of support from others, people checking in whether they hoped she was okay. You know, and this was, of course, social media's original justification that it would help people create supportive communities and especially people who had, a tr who had trouble relating to others in, in real life and that it would be a good thing. Um, you know, we've obviously seen the very dark side of social media, but in these, in these posts you can see at least some of that original promise uh, is, is fulfilled in these communities. Second reason that Trent's friends reject the mainstream media, it's fun. And I think this is one of the least understood and least studied elements of why people are drawn to communities that appear to reject what most of us would regard as, as reality, because it's fun. This was the key insight of a really interesting Medium article from September 2020, and all, all, the, all the references are in my slides, so you can, you can look at it. I really, really recommend it. It's in this article that the author, who's a video game designer, he argues that the popularity of the QAnon conspiracy is driven in large part by the fun that QAnon believers have solving puzzles and finding hidden meaning. And so understand what he's talking about. It's helpful to, to learn what for me was, uh, until recently, a pretty, was a new vocabulary term, apophenia. And that's the tendency to perceive a connection or meaningful pattern between unrelated or random things. And this principle, I would say, is deeply connected to this idea of doing your own research. Essentially, apophenia recruits people to create meaning out of randomness and to persuade themselves that false things are true. So I don't know if this is needed or not, but here's a quick QAnon refresher. It's the conspiracy theory based on the belief that Trump was battling a cabal of blood-sucking pedophilic celebrities and politicians. And Q was the code name given to sort of the, the master of all of this. Uh, the person who claimed to have this inside knowledge, and periodically, for a period of a couple of years, Q would share clues about how this fight was going. And in this one, he encourages his followers to look for celebrities who, and politicians who, who make these owl and Y-head signs. Now, instructions seemed a bit odd, but when you start looking, you can actually find <laughs> these signs um, or these gestures everywhere. Now this idea that you're tapping into something that most other people cannot see, it's what leads to the third thing that people get from participating in these communities. Um, they, they feel special. And I think there's a lot of reasons, sorry, let's get some water. <laughs> Sorry about that, I just lost my voice for a second. Okay, so feeling like people have access to this secret knowledge, um, it allows them to feel special. As I say, I think there's quite a few reasons for this, um, but as Julian Sanchez, who's a fellow at the, uh, the Libertarian Cato Institute explains, uh, there's a specific uh, reason um, that he, he looks into. Um, in a series of tweets about a year ago, he, uh, he 
explained his thinking here. So I'll give you, give you time to just read this for a second. Okay, so as you can see, um, Sanchez noted a parallel between anti-vaxxers uh, and election denialists. And Sanchez starts with the premise that most human knowledge is beyond any individual's capacity to personally verify. And so that means that really all of us have to take most things on authority. There isn't one group of people who do their own research about everything and another people who mindlessly trust experts. I mean, we basically all have to mindlessly trust experts on most things. Where there are differences, though, um, is in how these experts trust us or appear to. And the way Sanchez sees it, the real experts will level with you. They'll tell you that most people in their field think a certain way, and then they'll just admit to you that it's super complex, and then, they, they can't really explain it to you in a, in a two-minute YouTube video, and you sort of have to trust them. By contrast, the fake experts who Sanchez calls cranks, he says the cranks will flatter you by providing you with spreadsheets full of IP addresses, massive hex dumps, links to complicated scientific studies, and other things that no one without advanced degrees in computer science, biology, or maths would have any hope of evaluating or even beginning to understand. But that doesn't really matter, Sanchez says, because to many people, the experts plea to just trust them because it's complicated. Well, it feels patronizing. Whereas the cranks plea to, hey, do your own research, look at it for yourself, evaluate the data for yourself, well, it's flattering. Um, it, you know, it feels good to be trusted, seemingly trusted in that way. And so put another way, uh, I think the phrase, I do my own research, is really just a shorthand for I'm special. So to recap, Trent Hamness's friends and others who believe they have discovered secret knowledge that proves the mainstream media is lies, I think they get three things from their beliefs. They get to be part of a tight-knit community, they get to have fun, and they get to feel special. Now, um, if you've attended any of my previous presentations at UKSG, then you may remember I sort of have this bad habit of diagnosing a really sort of terrible problem and then just kind of going home. Um, well, I, I want to buck that trend here, and I actually want to make some substantive suggestions, things you can do, exercises you can try to save any students who have wandered into conspiracy theory territory and hopefully uh, harden the resistance of others who might be vulnerable. So the challenge then is to come up with exercises that will help students understand the danger of getting their news from social media and extremist websites. Help them appreciate what the mainstream media has to offer and ultimately get to a point where it just feels better not to trust social media and extremist sites and instead get most of their news from the mainstream media. So the first thing I think you have to do is you have to create a sense of community. Unfortunately, I actually don't think this is very difficult. Over the past years, we've seen lots of uh, examples of these kinds of projects. These are essentially projects where uh, an organization will bring people together, um, people who identify very different politically, and the idea is they sit down, they relate to each other as real people and not as these abstract labels like conservative or liberal, and, um, and, they, and it helps, right? They, they, they feel better. The persistent critique of these kinds of meetings, though, is that it doesn't last, that you know, they relate to each other fine when they're sitting down talking to each other, but then they go back to their relatively homogeneous communities and, and nothing's really changed. So that critique, I think, shows why um, the classroom or the school or university library is a particularly good uh, place to do these kinds of um, exercise and meetings because you can do them uh, repeatedly over the course of a semester or a school year. So what kind of activities uh, are likely to be effective? Well, one thing to remember is they have to be fun because that's what you're competing against. They have to be fun like solving a riddle and QAnon is fun. Um, and the exercises, therefore, I think, have to promote interest, engagement, and curiosity. 
Now this first exercise um, I call golf, because uh, really just because the lower score wins. And this exercise is designed to help students realize the dangers of one of their favorite places to go to for information and answers, and that's YouTube. It's really important, I think, that they understand that algorithms work very differently uh, in YouTube than they do in subscription databases, and even in Google proper. On YouTube, you can get to uh, conspiracy theory type videos really quickly. And here I'm indebted to um, a lot of the research done by uh, Dana Boyd, who's a media literacy expert um, and, and, uh, and a researcher. So here's the exercise. You divide class into groups um, and you assign them a controversial topic. And then the students in each group should then uh, discuss what they think would make a video on that topic fake news or a conspiracy theory. And this is, you know, don't kid myself here, this is not going to be uh, a, a simple, easy conversation, but it's a good conversation. I think you should encourage your students to keep going until they've reached some kind of consensus. And then each student should try and get to a fake news or conspiracy theory video as defined by the group. They should get there in as few clicks as possible, and the one who gets there first is the winner. So here's an example using the topic of vaccines. Um, first, as a group, we discuss what, make, what might make a video about vaccines, fake news, or a conspiracy theory. Um, I search in YouTube. Uh, you then click on uh, one of the results, so that's click one. And then from there, you're looking at recommended videos. Uh, and every click, um, you know, you just, you just add up. And then by the time you get to a conspiracy theory, then at that point, you, you add up your clicks. So I was able to get from this, the generic search term vaccines to a video uh, saying that the vaccination program was a, uh, an attempt by George Soros to promote uh, a new world order in five clicks. Um, and I may have been able to do it quicker. So anyway, hopefully this is some, this would hopefully be a video that your group would say, yeah, that's really kind of conspiracy theory. Um, and anyway, so the point is just to really show how easy, is it get, easy it is to get to conspiracy theories using legitimate search terms and only clicking on the um, and recommended videos. Okay, this next video I would call bowling because this time the highest score wins and it involves frames. So the objective here is to get students to understand that the judgments they make about the trustworthiness of articles often has less to do with what's in those articles and more to do with things like tone uh, and framing. And so here again, I want to refer to the work of Jonathan Haidt. Uh, Haidt has argued that there are five moral foundations on which more specific values are built. And these foundations are authority, purity, care, loyalty, and fairness. Now, generally speaking, people on the political left, they tend to value care and fairness pretty much exclusively. Whereas people more on the right will value those two, but they'll often value and often more highly value these other foundations of authority, loyalty, and purity. Now, in this exercise, again, you can divide students up into groups and tell them to, and then what you do is you tell them to find an article that is framed clearly in terms of one of those five moral foundations. When they find that article, they should then rewrite the introduction to that article so that it is reframed in terms of a different moral foundation. And then they would read to the other students in their group uh, the, um, the original introduction and then the revised introduction, and they get a point for every student who thinks that their rewrite is actually more trustworthy than the original and would inspire more faith in the whole article. So here's a quick illustration of how that could work. Um, this is using a, uh, an example from a study by the Media Insight Project. Now the basic facts of the story is that the director of the city's parks has uh, taken money that was supposed to be used for um, constructing a new recreational facility for uh, disadvantaged um, uh, in a disadvantaged community, and he's diverted that money to businesses, uh, uh, irrelevant businesses run by family and friends. So here's the original version of the story, uh, and it focuses on that moral, or frames things in terms of that moral, those moral foundations of care and fairness. 
uh, it emphasizes the fact that, again, that a disadvantaged community is now going to suffer because of the misuse of city funds. And here's a revised introduction uh, with a different framing. This time, the story is framed in terms of uh, uh, authority, specifically a disrespect for authority. The park boss has deceived the mayor. And also disloyalty. The park boss has diverted funds away from his own community. Now, readers who valued moral foundations besides just care and fairness, they overwhelmingly preferred the second version of this article and reported uh, greater trust in it, even though the facts are exactly the same. Okay, this is the last exercise. Um, I call it a breakthrough exercise. And its objective is to help students demystify conspiracy theory terms that have broken through into the mainstream. Um, let me show you what I'm talking about and then I'll come back to why I think this is important. Okay, so here is the, uh, an example using the, uh, the Newsbank um, research platform and in particular the date facet or the date filter. Now this facet gives you an easy way of seeing how frequently particular terms were used in newspaper articles over different periods. So here we're pretty far zoomed out. The, the blue rectangles rec, uh, represent decades. And so what this tells you is that this search term, and I'll tell you what it is in a second, um, or this term rather, was not used much at all in newspapers in the 1980s and 1990s and the 2000s. But sometime between 2010 and 2019, uh, you can see it really took off. Now, the term is crisis actor. Now, crisis actor is a term that had been kicking about on far-right pro-gun conspiracy sites for many, many years. And in this context, it referred to somebody who was paid to help stage, to help fake a mass shooting so that the government, the US government, would then have a pretext to impose gun control measures. There's a whole cottage industry dedicated to proving that some of these high-profile shootings, like the one in Parkland, Florida, the early one in Newtown, Connecticut, and no doubt the one last week in Uvalde, Texas, that they just never happened. Anyway, if you drill down more, you can see there was a big spike of usage in 2018. You keep going, you see that it was in February, and that was the month of the Parkland High School shooting. Uh, keep going, you see that the big spike happened on February 21st. Now, it's interesting. This was a week after this sh shooting, um, which happened on February 14th. So why was it? What happened on February 20th or 21st that led to this big spike? Well, what happened was on the night of February 20th, a CNN news anchor, Anderson Cooper, asked one of the Parkland students um, if he was a crisis actor. Um, and uh, the student named David Hogg uh, said, no, I'm not, a, I'm not a crisis actor. And the next day, that exchange was, was, it was quoted a lot in newspaper articles in the mainstream media. Same, ki same kind of uh, example here. A term has very little currency for several decades, and then it spikes. The term is white genocide, and it spiked in the 2010s, specifically in 2019, in March, March 15th specifically. And that is when a terrorist killed 49 Muslim worshippers in New Zealand. And newspapers reported that he had used the term white genocide in his so-called manifesto. Now, I said earlier that I think this exercise is, is an important one. And I think it's important because one of the conspiracy theorists' most effective recruiting tools is mainstreaming concepts like that, like crisis action, white genocide. And so when people see them a lot, they, they think to themselves, if only sort of subconsciously, oh, well, they must refer to something, to something real, and they get curious, and they Google these terms, and because these conspiracy groups are very skilled in search engine optimization, some of the people that uh, Google these terms end up falling down these rabbit holes of, of really harmful content. Now, by using the date filter on the Newsbank platform, it's possible to see that these terms didn't spontaneously ar arise to describe real things that were happening in the world. There were not these fake shootings which required us to invent a name so we could talk about them. And as we've seen, the term crisis actor didn't really spike 
after the event itself, but a week later uh, in, a, in a discussion, in an interview where uh, CNN anchor, who was of course trying to discredit this crazy term, uh, actually uh, ended up bringing this term into the mainstream. And you can see all of that so clearly if you look at, you know, if you use news data, uh, databases to see the uh, frequency of these terms. So I think if students can understand the etymology of, of these conspiracy theory type terms, they can see them for what they are. And hopefully, they can see how untrustworthy these conspiracy sites are in comparison to the mainstream medium. Okay, the third thing that people drawn to conspiracy sites get is, uh, is that you know, they feel that they're special, and we've looked at reasons for, for why. So if your students do these exercises or exercises like the ones I've suggested here, then they will almost kind of by definition be seeing things that other people don't see. And that will make them feel a bit special maybe. And that's good because as we've seen with Trent Hamness's friends, uh, people are motivated to do things when they feel uh, special. However, you don't want your students to feel so special that they then come to think that they have some kind of unique skill in detecting fake news or conspiracy theories. Fortunately, I think there are some ways to minimize this risk, and I have three of them I'll suggest. One is keep your focus when you're having these discussions and doing these activities, keep your focus on the process, not the outcome. The thing that the student should take from exercises like the ones that we've looked at is not, um, well, it's, it's, just that, it's just that there are these processes that anybody can follow, and if anybody follows them, then they'll be, they'll be more effective at evaluating sources. There's nothing uh, special about them. Anybody can follow these processes. Two, um, as much as possible, avoid using abstract pronouns. Because in deconstructing a conspiracy theory, you don't want to replace it for another. For example, you, know, you don't want students to go from thinking the government is staging mass shootings to Facebook is trying to make me think the government is staging mass shootings. Because while it is important for students to understand there are groups out there who, who do not have their best interest at heart, and these groups are manipulating uh, Facebook, um, Google, YouTube algorithms to promote harmful content, there's, there's nothing mysterious about this. You know, in each case, there are specific groups who are doing it, they have specific objectives, and they're using specific understandable uh, techniques. So always name or at least describe the bad actors, the conspiracy theory actors who are doing the manipulation. Because you want to discourage students from internalizing the message that there is some anonymous they out there who is always trying to manipulate them. Last thing I'd say is be willing to concede that editorial processes aren't perfect. Uh, you could highlight maybe some specific ma mistakes that newspapers have made and then show corrections and in some cases apologies that have later been published. Um, you don't, you know, you really don't want your students' expectations for mainstream media to be like my students back in the day, their expectations for the New York Times. Um, they can't be too high, they can't be so high that uh, one mistake discredits the entire publication in their eyes. Okay, so this is the question I am going to leave you with. How can you break down political and other barriers to sustain meaningful communities Make learning exercises fun while teaching crucial information literacy principles and create an environment where your students feel special, special enough that they are motivated to educate themselves about information and how in 2022 information is produced and consumed, but not so special that they start to see meaning in random connections and even while deconstructing a specific conspiracy theory, actually reinforce a general conspiracy theory mindset. Um, and we're out of time. No, but seriously, um, this, is, uh, this, is my, um, this is my last slide. I just wanted to tell you about an experience I had last October. It was my, um, my first in-conference, uh, sorry, in-person conference since the pandemic. It was a, a school librarians conference held in Salt Lake City, Utah. This one, as you can see, uh, looked a bit different. Um, you know, a lot of that was the masks, but it also felt different. And the messages were, seemed different to me than previous uh, school librarian conferences I had attended. It was, Oh, it's, been long, it's long been clear that uh, school librarians, university librarians, see helping students evaluate information, um, helping them detect fake stuff um, and, and know what's good and reliable. They've always seen that as part of their job, 
At this conference, it seemed to me that most of these librarians saw it as their whole job, as their entire job. And in a way, I think that's not fair. Uh, librarians are being stretched. You know, they're often the ones who are called on to support students and teachers who are burned out. Um, I'm sure it was no accident that at this conference last October, two of the sessions I attended started with deep breathing exercises. Um, but you know, here we are for good, and for, for good or for ill. Uh, and I think librarians, I think you are well positioned to help students navigate challenges uh, in our increasingly complex, fragmented, and sometimes really quite frightening world. And I have all the respect in the world for you, and I wish you the very best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Adam. That was a really uh, interesting presentation, and I really liked all the practical tips you had there for people dealing with um, these issues um, in, their, in their libraries. Um, I've just checked the app. There haven't been any questions that have come in yet, so I wanted to see if there's any questions in the room. No, okay, not at the moment. I, w I want to ask you something. Yeah. And it's going, sl it's, it's moving away from the students' mm -hmm. side of things, because I also have one of those rel relatives mm -hmm. that <laughs> posts, you know, fake news on, on Facebook and, and deals, and I think that, the, and, and things like that. So it's how do we, how, you know, what, are there any tools that we can use in combating that, um, with other people, not just our students. I mean, yeah. how do we go about dealing with this? As, as, as librarians, it pains me every time I see something, um, but I don't really know how to respond to it. So are there any practical tools or tips that you can, you can give us in dealing with the yeah, crazy I'm, cousin? I'm, I'm probably not a good person since, I, since that aunt I mentioned, as I say, she blocked me, but, um, uh, but that was a couple of years ago. I think I, have a, I would have a different approach now. I mean, I think, I think we all sort of got to a point where it seems it's clear that just saying, hey, you're wrong, doesn't work, and, and look, you're wrong, and I can prove it because read this, because they will just dismiss the source. Um, I mean, I think we, for years, we had belief that kind of fact-checking would work, and then we realized, well, no, somebody who doesn't believe in the mainstream media believes that the, um, you know, fact-checking, and they're kind of in, in bed with the media and all that. So the only thing that uh, I, I can think of is to um, is to try and uh, find some common ground because I think the impulses that lead people to conspiracy theories and believing in those they're just very human impulses that we all have and so to the extent you can sort of validate that um, and then and then ask them to explain to you and so you feel like you're listening listening to them but it's uh, it's not an exact science and so if anybody else has any um, uh, any sort of tips, I would, I would be like to hear them as well. Anyone else have any comments or questions? Um, oh. Great, we do, we do have something come in. Um, Okay, so um, in UK mainstream media sources, not just tabloids, um, uh, they've actu actively created extremist myths, for example, um, Birmingham Council renamed Christmas Winterville to pander to, to Muslims and insult Christianity. Oh no, sorry, I shouldn't have asked that. That's, yeah, that's not a it's comment, yeah. question. Um, I miss, so, I'm, let me just read these before I read them out. Um, Okay, this is from Laura Tobler. I miss the time element. Content on social media is often shared too quickly to have been read or listened to by the person who shared it. Yeah. This should be a warning signal. So a message should be, take time to evaluate a material before sharing it. Yeah. But time is important to students because they want to be cool by sharing interesting content first. How do you address the time element? That's an interesting one. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think... Um I think it's always a good answer to, uh, yeah, to, 
to take a breath and, um, and, and wait. Um, how you persuade people to do that, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how you do it. Um, but I think it's a really, I think that person who asked that question raises a really important issue. Uh, and, and it's, the problem is the speed with which people get stuff out there because once, you know, once, once a message is out there, it can be really quite difficult to, uh, to hold back. And so there's certainly value in waiting, waiting on, on the facts, but as to how you persuade people to do it, again, I, I don't know. Um, I think there was a comment back here as well, or a question. Thanks, Adam. <clears throat> I've heard you speak before. It's always very sobering. Um, and something I was thinking about last time and today um, is really about the platforms that are used here. So whether it's TikTok or YouTube or Facebook or, or Twitter, social media platforms. Do you think there's a role for them to play around weeding out content that's nefarious, that's concerning? Or is it more about empowering users to develop that, that kind of critical perspective? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think it has to be both. I, um, I mean, the, the argument that the, you know, the big tech giants made for a number of years was, you know, you should treat us like a phone company, right? You're just neutral. But, you know, ev every study, every bit of research done, um, recently or in the last few years uh, shows how dangerous that is and how different Twitter or Facebook or TikTok is from you know the phone the phone's company and so I think you have to uh, I mean well I come down on the because they're so different from a phone company because they have so much influence there have to be rules. We have to regulate them. Now, there can be disagreement about how far you should go, but it seems to me uh, if you, it's because they're so influential that um, you, you, you just can't treat them like a phone company. Um, having, having said that, uh, I do think there's a limit to what you can, you can sort of forcefully uh, regulate, and I do think uh, it, it's essential to try and improve the critical thinking skills uh, so that people are not uh, so caught up in them. Uh, it's, you know, it's very diff difficult. I um, installed an, a a an app on my 14-year-old's phone which limits the amount of time he can use TikTok to 30 minutes a day, but it gives him a chance to uh, request more. And like, I'm sure there's like three requests when, you know, for it when I, uh, when I, when I get done. I mean, he's, he's just sort of obsessed with it. And um, so I think that's really alarming. I mean, the, sh the short answer is that's really alarming. But I suppose there is also an opportunity there. And, and I mentioned this conference, um, you know, last year. And another big change there was I felt like a few years ago, librarians in the US were focused on how do we get students not to use TikTok? And even before that, how do we get them not to use Wikipedia and stuff? It seemed to me the mainstream position now was, hey, this is what people are, the kids are using. We need to go there. And so we need to find ways to get this messaging out through TikTok and, you know, and the kind of apps that they're using. And a number of librarians had created their own videos which they shared on TikTok. Now, how effective they were, I don't know. But there was a recognition that um, uh, these, these apps are so, so influential that you know, we're kind of disarming by not using them. So, I hope that answers your question. Um, thank you. And one last question is just yeah. coming on the app, but, um, which is related to this. Apart from regulating social media platforms and trying to weed out incorrect content, is there anything we can do to push more authoritative content to, to users? Actually, is there anything to be done, not necessarily by us as librarians, but what can be done to push more authoritative content to users? Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's difficult, right, because um, YouTube has, uh, has deleted a lot of, has removed a lot of uh, 
of sort of bad conspiracy theory type content. And the, you know, the idea, of course, is that um, you know, the more authoritative content will then have more prominence and people will see that first. The problem is, is that the, you know, the conspiracy theorists, and, and I, I realize I'm, this is kind of a shorthand, I'm using kind of conspiracy theory type language here, which I, 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 if I were writing, I'd be more careful. But the conspiracy theorists have realized that they can get around these, these um, rules pretty easily. Because whereas it's pretty clear cut, right, if somebody says, oh, the COVID-19 vaccine kills 50% of the people who get it. Okay, well, that can be removed, right? But if somebody says, hey, are you sure that this was really tested properly? Then it's hard to know what criteria you would have to invoke to remove something like that. And in any case, you remove it and, it, and then something else will go in its, its place. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm sort of one for five in providing answers to these questions. So I, I guess it's just recognition that these are real complex questions and, and real challenges. But I do think uh, the, you know, the first step is understanding really what people get out of, uh, you know, out of these communities. And as I say, if I really going to just recommend one article to you, and it will, the, the, note, the, the citation will be in my uh, slides, it's that, that article in Medium from September 2020 uh, by the video game designer. Super interesting. Thank you very much, Adam. It was a really uh, interesting, insightful session. And asked as many questions, of course, as it, okay. as it answered. But thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody.